Hello, everyone. Welcome to another webinar, Canadian Psychedelic Association. I am thrilled to be here with Dr. Erica Dick today. She is one of the most important people, I think, in psychedelic medicine right now because she brings us up to date. She brings the history that all this is, everything that's transpiring right now in psychedelics is built on. And I think it's really important to, to understand where we've come from so that we know where we are and how we got here and where we are going. So on, on that, I'm going to hand it over to her right away. Dr. Erica Dick is a professor and a Canada Research Chair in the History of Health and Social Justice at the University of Saskatchewan. She is the author of Psychedelic Psychiatry, uh, Facing Eugenics, a co-author of Managing Madness and Challenging Choices, and the co-editor of Psychedelic Profits. You have a lot of books on that. Culture's Catalyst, and she is also a member of the Shakuna Institute for Psychedelic Plant Medicine. We are gonna put uh, actually a link to her full list of publications in the chat for you. And additionally, we're gonna put a link to her Wikipedia page here because this woman is brilliant and you should not only watch this webinar, but other webinars and other interviews on, on the web with Erica. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Dr. Erica Dick. Thank you, Pam, for that embarrassingly generous uh, introduction. I am going to attempt to share my screen, uh, which I will need um, access to, apparently. One thing we didn't check in our... In our <laughs> Stand by. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here, and I'm really grateful to everyone. I know that uh, many of us are melting in our homes right now or wherever we are. And so I really appreciate everyone taking the time out of their hot summer days or, or their rainy summer days, as the case may be, to, to participate in this meeting today and, when, and whenever it is that you are able to join. And I will get this started. Wonderful. Um, and I, I will also just acknowledge uh, a couple of things. One, I'm, I'm speaking to you from Saskatoon, which is Treaty 6 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis. I am also speaking to you during a thunderstorm storm. So uh, I hope that that does not interrupt any of the Wi-Fi connections or the sound, but um, I also hope that it cools us off a little bit here. So, <laughs> um, well, as Pam mentioned, I've been really sort of fascinated by the history of psychedelics. And today I'm going to talk about the history of psychedelics in Canada, which is what I've been studying for approximately the last 20 years. Um, but as some of us were talking about leading up to this, this is a story that is global in nature. This is a story that is bigger than um, the story of psychedelics per se, a word that was coined in the 1950s. It is a story that sort of touches a variety of different spaces and cultures and vocabularies. And I hope that this contribution today, which focuses on Canada, will also be an entry point into a variety of other conversations that I I imagine are going to be blossoming over the next few years as this story just gets richer. I started doing this research in uh, 2001. I was a PhD student at McMaster University and I was sort of excited about the idea of the history of psychedelics and people sort of my committee members and friends and colleagues were sort of chiding me for choosing a topic that they felt was going to, you know, mean that I was going to go around interviewing hippies and deadheads and, you know, these sort of acid freaks. This was the language that was leveled at me at the time. Um, and while these are very interesting stories, that wasn't really my particular interest. And in the early 2000s, looking into the, the available literature at the time, and remember this is, you know, there was internet, but there, um, the search engines were not quite as powerful. And so a lot of this was library-based work. This was trolling through archives and newspapers. And the stories that existed at that time or the ones that were readily available really captured a sense of psychedelics, and I'll, I'll pick upon LSD in particular here, as being part of a dark chapter in the history of psychiatry, a dark chapter in mind control, in espionage studies, so CIA funded um, studies, sort of Cold War inspired um, unethical trials. And that was kind of a persistent message or story that came to characterize this period of history. So the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s even, the research that was associated with psychedelics had these two sort of elements. Countercultural formation, but also unethical, wrongheaded, and 
research that led to the non-medical use, or sorry, the, the non-therapeutic uses of um, drugs like LSD, psilocybin, um, and later MDMA and mescaline. But there again, this was sort of unsatisfying to me. And I started scrolling through newspapers and finding, you know, other stories that had been sort of buried, at least from my 2001 perspective, you know, this notion that there was a lot of enthusiasm historically about the place of things like LSD, masculine and psilocybin, those three substances in particular, in terms of their potential to change the way we think about mental illness and change the way that we treat mental illness and, and really sort of theorize around mental health and healing. So I love this image from the Toronto Star Weekly, which sort of reminds us that we're in the midst of a space race, you know, Russia first man into space. And here still on the front cover is, you know, LSD, miracle drug or menace. And I was captivated by this idea that there was enough enthusiasm in the research community to um, justify a front page ad in 1961 that described LSD as a potential miracle drug or a drug that perhaps was sort of sitting on, uh, could oscillate in either direction. So I'm going to back up a little bit and talk about the discovery of LSD um, and then move this through into the Canadian story. So many of you are probably familiar with Albert Hoffman, who's a Swiss biochemist who was working in Sandoz Pharmaceutical Laboratories in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and I've just been reading some really fascinating papers by Swiss researchers who are going through these papers with fresh eyes. Um, and so I, I can't say very much about that right now because I, I'm still digesting it, um, but stay posted. There's no, there are new stories to be told about Albert Hoffman's not so serendipitous discovery, I think as they will, they will convince us. Albert Hoffman was looking for a variety of different things. Um, Switzerland had sort of inherited a pharmaceutical marketing um, edge, if you will. During the Second World War, as German pharmaceutical companies were literally bombed and pushed out of the marketplace, Switzerland inherited a kind of competitive edge. And there was a lot of research and national focus in this space on developing pharmaceuticals. And Albert Hoffman was one of many, many researchers who was looking into plant uh, alkaloids, plant chemicals, and trying to look at ways of synthesizing particular kind of plant substances, not all for pharmaceutical reasons, but in this case, it transformed in that way. And the story, as the story goes, in 1938, he um, synthesized a part of the ergot fungus into d lysergic acid diethylamide, but he had not experienced its effects until April of 1943. At that time, he had the first uh, alleged uh, LSD experience, and this took him by surprise. But the next day, he intentionally engaged in his own sort of LSD voyage, which plunged him into a very um, colorful world, a very dramatic set of sensory changes, hallucinations. This is a, um, an image I'll, I'll give the reference for at the end of this presentation. It's a graphic novel that's um, about to be released in November, which captures and sort of uh, turns into cartoon form. This is not the only book that does it, um, but Albert Hoffman's discovery and his own excursion, which has been memorialized in his own work, as well as his sort of famous bicycle trip where he gets on his bicycle and he describes how he could feel his legs moving, but he couldn't understand, you know, how the bicycle was propelling forward. He felt that he'd been plunged into a Salvador Dali painting and this the visual distortions that he experienced sort of transfixed him both in, in moments of terror, wondering whether he had driven himself mad, but also in moments of awe. And I think that's captured in his book, which he later wrote called LSD, My Problem Child. And there's this kind of um, ambivalence about uh, whether this was a miracle drug or a menace, if you will. I wanna also just quickly mention, sorry, I'm gonna go back because I, I can't help it, but. Um, I've recently learned about Susie Ramstein's also her experience. So she's the first woman to take LSD. And Susie was Albert's uh, assistant, laboratory assistant. And she actually accompanied him on these excursions, uh, the first two, keeping him safe, and then went on uh, her own excursion. And so if you can read about Susie's tram ride in the Shakurna Chronicles, which I think is, is in the chat at some point. Hoffman's discovery is fascinating for so many reasons, but I think one of the things to bear in mind is that this emphasis on investing in pharmaceutical research in the Cold War, in a post-Second World War moment, um, was something that was pretty typical 
typical. Uh, there were a lot of places and a lot of um, sort of industrial interest in creating synthesized versions of plant medicines, but also in investing in pharmaceutical solutions to a lot of what was considered modern problems. And, and so he, this is a quote from Stanislaw Graf, who again may be familiar to many of the attendees here, who says that Dr. Hoffman's discovery of LSD generated a powerful wave of interest in brain chemistry. And together with the development of tranquilizers, we may think of things like chlorpromazine and some of the antidepressant medications at this time, these things have been directly responsible for what has been called the golden age of psychopharmacology. And a number of commentators, pharmacologists, as well as historians and sociologists have recognized the 1950s as being a real turning point in the way that we conceptualize and give vocabulary to mental health and illness. The introduction of the Diagnostics and Statistics Manual, which codifies um, some of the psychiatric disorders, well, all of the psychiatric disorders, according to the American Psychiatric Association, this was also introduced in the 1950s. And so you see a real shift in the way people are talking about, thinking about, and researching um, solutions, if you will, to mental health and illness at this time. We also see a dramatic increase in the advertisements, largely those leveled at physicians, but over time also those direct to consumer advertisements in thinking about reaching for pharmaceuticals, reaching for pills um, to manage a whole variety of um, behavioral issues, a whole variety of psychological issues. Um, and it, it really runs the gamut. Uh, a colleague of, I, of mine and I are doing a sort of global study of this. We're looking at different jurisdictions and what we're finding are incredibly consistent themes about the dramatic turn to a pharmaceutical moment um, in this Cold War period. So beginning in the 1950s. So if you imagine you're a journalist now in the 1950s and someone tells you about this LSD experience, it is not so bizarre in the context of this dramatic turn to pharmaceutical research at this time. Um, this paradigmatic shift, according to psychopharmacologist David Healy, that has us thinking about and imagining different ways of experimenting with psychoactive substances to begin thinking more deeply about human brains and behavior. So I don't think that LSD raised too many alarm bells, if you will, in the sort of conventional research landscape at that time. But I want to bring this story to Canada, and, and not simply because this is where I am, but because I think Canada had an incredibly important role to play in then taking that pharmaceutical research and that experimentation to another level. Some of you may know that in 1944, Saskatchewan elected the CCF, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, or what became the NDP. Um, this was the first so-called socialist government in North America, um, and uh, they elected Premier Tommy Douglas, who also worked as the, functioned as the health minister at the time. Now, there were many reasons I think the CCF was elected, but one of the main reasons was promising deep and comprehensive healthcare reforms. That is ushering in a publicly funded healthcare system, the system that we today call Medicare. In, as part of those very um, sort of prioritizing those healthcare reforms was also reaching out around the world largely to Britain and Europe, um, but reaching out to a variety of places and drawing in researchers who were thinking outside the box, so to speak, who were thinking sort of outside of conventional ways of treating things like mental illness. And Douglas had his own personal convictions about uh, addressing questions about mental health and illness. He'd worked as an intern at one of the largest asylums in Western Canada, um, and he had written his thesis on this topic. He was very well versed with this though coming from a position as a Baptist minister and a, and a politician, not as a physician. And so he reached out and advertised for high ranking research directorship positions and was able to recruit people to Saskatchewan under the sort of ideological guise of investing in healthcare reforms. Interviewing some of the researchers who came to Saskatchewan during this time, um, some of them described it in more ideological ways than others, but one of the sort of consistent themes that emerged was the elaborate amount of research freedom that they had, the capacity to feel a kind of secure support for the scientific research that was taking place, that they could invest in these ideas, and they had the support of the government, which also coincided with support in terms of research dollars. And some of the people who came, and I just give a, a quick snapshot here, um, Abe Hoffer, who was a biochemist, he got his PhD in Minnesota in serial chemistry, so he was looking at ergot, for example, which is related to the Swiss um, story as well. Um, but he went on to become a psychiatrist and was particularly interested in schizophrenia. 
Abe Hoffer's sister, Fannie Cahan, on the left of your screen, was a journalist for the Winnipeg Free Press and also a journalist locally in Saskatchewan prior to moving to Winnipeg. She is really important in part because she helped take some of the scientific research that was being done at the time and translate that essentially into digestible public communication. And so I think these kind of happenstance partnerships were actually vital to getting the message about the science communication words we would use today. But she was sort of a, a built in um, component of that science communication strategy. Fanny Cahan, um, again on your left, was married to Erwin Cahan, and I'm sorry, their pictures are not from the same time periods of their lives. Uh, Erwin Cahan, who died recently, was um, the, the director of the Canadian Mental Health Association. And so he both had this sort of advocacy role, but he also had the ear of the government. And so in this just little quick snapshot, what I want to impress upon you is that this from the very beginning was politically charged. It was interdisciplinary, it was familial, it was locally embedded in the community in which this research was taking place. And it required these different voices and these different skill sets to bring the story forward. So I wanna to get to what the story is. All right, so how did Masculine and LSD come to Saskatchewan? The fellow in the red shirt is Sidney Katz. He's a reporter for McLean's Magazine. And in 1953, he traveled to Weyburn, Saskatchewan, which is a little bit southeast uh, of Regina. And it had one of the largest psychiatric facilities or asylums in Western Canada. Some people argue it was the largest in the British Commonwealth, but I think that may not be true. Don't, read, don't believe everything you read in the newspapers. Sitting to his right or on, the, like, on our left on the screen is Humphrey Osmond. Humphrey Osmond had trained at the Maudsley Hospital. He had also been working in British psychiatry for some time and he was rather frustrated by what he felt were sort of uh, limitations or restrictions on his ability to do research. He was very interested in hallucinations and he had learned about mescaline studies but he was unable to get the clearances required to do the research in Britain at the time as a junior researcher. He answered the job ad to come to Saskatchewan and work in this other research environment and here he sort of flourished as he became um, a real sort of lightning rod for bringing together researchers from other places, but also for really developing ideas and a sophisticated set of ideas about what psychedelics might come to represent. He is, in fact, the man who introduced the word psychedelics. When Sidney Katz came in 1953, McLean's magazine did a 12 page spread on the research, the exciting research that was unfolding here in the place where there were a lot of eyes on Saskatchewan already, what was gonna happen within these healthcare reforms and what kind of scientific research was being done in order to support these healthcare reforms. And there were essentially two different arms of this that I'm gonna talk about here. There are other pieces and lots of sort of dead ends or theses that didn't, um, didn't evolve into something more, but, but for today's purposes, and I'm happy to take questions, I wanna talk about the two main pieces that I think are really critical to understanding how this story moves forward. These again are from uh, the book Wonder Drug, which I'll, I'll reference at the end, um, but these are depicting the way that Sidney Katz experienced his, um, in this case, LSD experience. So remember, this is 1953. These are early days in, in the world of um, psychedelic research. Sidney Katz um, described his experience. He explores the sort of distortions of perception that he, he um, experienced. He, um, they hired an artist to sit with him to try to sketch out what he was describing and also to confer with him afterwards. They played music. Um, they had therapists present at all time, a psychiatrist, a social worker, a psychologist, um, actually, and, and a medical doctor. And Katz sort of introduces Canadian readers to this experience. And the sort of medical justification for what they were doing was, was twofold. One was to create a model psychosis. That is to give, in this case, mostly staff, probably volunteers. I, I mean that by that, um, there were a lot of wives of staff members who came in and were also part of the sort of volunteer group. Um, so they're not considered staff, but they're definitely considered part of the research. They're not paid as far as I can tell, but they're very critical to how we understand and how we give voice and vocabulary to some of these experiences. The model psychosis was trying to look at the inner world of the schizophrenic patient um, and try to understand what it was like to have disordered speech, to have um, your sense of reality shattered in a way that made it difficult for you to communicate those ideas. 
this was really important to psychiatrists who were really sort of stuck in, in the world of psychiatry, stuck working with psychotic patients who they felt they couldn't reach. Psychoanalysis did not work with patients who could not communicate. Um, psychiatric medications, which were not yet, they were in the process of being um, introduced, were not yet available. And the kinds of therapies available were very harsh, electroshock therapy, lobotomies, in some jurisdictions um, were more rapid than others. But trying to understand the inner world of the psychiatric mind was a really exciting opportunity for researchers. The second piece is around addictions. I, I'll just dwell here for a moment though. So these are some excerpts from Sydney Katz. You can look at these, McLean's has now digitized all of their back issues that you can go and look at the one from October 1953 and see the full spread. And he's talking here about how he can't explain what's happening. There are no words in the English language designed to convey the sensations, and I won't read this all out for you. Um, but this notion of a kind of feeling trapped within the limited vocabulary at his disposal to describe what seemed to him to be a kind of out of world experience or out of mind experience. He watched, you know, the, the hallucinations that disordered um, his images of the room around him. This kind of research attracted attention from a variety of people, not just medical personalities, but also people like Aldous Huxley, who by 1953 was already a very famous writer, of course, Brave New World being one of the books that sort of put him on the literary landscape. Um, but he became really enchanted with this idea that you could use psychoactive substances to peek into other ways of thinking about consciousness, other ways of describing it, other ways of experiencing it. He was very well versed in a whole philosophical tradition, a, a very well versed and, uh, you know, connected to different religious ideas, different orthodox and unorthodox ways of thinking about spirituality, religion, um, parapsychology. He's very interested in these kinds of things. And the opportunity to be to have his ideas tested by tampering with his own reality was very seductive to him. So he wrote a letter to all to sorry to Humphrey Osmond in 1953, and Osmond obligingly traveled to Los Angeles to bring Aldous Huxley Mescaline. This sort of cemented their friendship almost immediately. They became fast friends and wrote to each other frequently. They visited each other whenever they could, and it's through their friendship and correspondence that the word psychedelic comes to being. And uh, I don't expect anyone to read this, but I'm a historical nerd and want to show you the um, actual documentation. Um, in the letters back and forth, you can see them trying to sort of answer Sidney Katz's call. You know, there are no words in the English language, he says, designed to convey these feelings. Here, they're sort of playing with the idea that we can find a word that captures those sensations. At the bottom of the letter on your left, you can see Aldous Huxley's attempts here of phenarathym, phenarathymic, playing with different derivations. Latin ones primarily. And what Hux, sorry, what Osmond writes, um, you can see Huxley says, to make this trivial world sublime, take half a gram of phenarathon. And what Osmond writes on the bottom of that page is to plumb the depths or sore angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. The next day, when he writes again, he changes it again to fathom hell or go angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. And if you Google these phrases, you will see a variety of different variations on it. Um, but they were testing these ways of capturing something that they felt was not tied to the pharmaceutical enterprise, which was in ascendancy at this time. It was not tied to psychodynamic theories, which were also very present in their sort of uh, professional landscape. They wanted something that was different and that still captured some of the, the sort of medical, I should say, the more healing language that they were driving at here, but was unencumbered. I think that was the word that Osmond used unencumbered by other already set in motion traditions. And one of the ways that psychedelic therapies then began to appeal to people was in thinking about approaching addiction. There was a lot of discussion contemporaneous with this. So at the same time, uh, physicians, including people like E.M. Jelinek at Yale, which was a leading institution, it maybe still is, but in terms of addiction studies, in thinking about the medicalization of addiction, so moving it out of the field of criminology, moving it away from a space where we think about incarcerating people for their moral failings, but instead thinking about addiction as a medical problem, one that requires a kind of health intervention, a medicalized moment. So people like E.M. Jelinek were arguing for this kind of disease uh, model for addictions and LSD therapy seemed to fit the bill. 
They argued that by using LSD, they could help uh, they could help alcoholics in this case, or people with problem drinking, there's different language used, realize that they needed help. And this coincided with sort of the competing model, which was the Alcoholics Anonymous non-medical model for intervention with, in this case, alcohol addiction or alcoholism. And again, I'm, I'm kind of dancing around some of the historical language here because, uh, you know, if I stick strictly to the historical language, they would not call it alcoholism just yet. Bill W., one of the co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, argued that, yes, indeed, this model, this idea of psychedelic therapy prior to his own experiences with it, fit with the 12-step model, which, at least in his words, for step two, required people kind of surrendering to the idea that they needed help. Those are my words, obviously. Step two here from the 1955 version of the big book is on your screen. This notion has also really captivated a lot of researchers who are wondering whether there's a spiritual component to addictions um, healing, but also it was starting to match, not necessarily with some of the medical language that was used to describe what LSD experiences were like, but a lot of the patient's experiences often invoked spiritual language and spiritual responses. And it, it caused researchers um, to sometimes lean into that a little bit, but also be a little bit more flexible in the way that they were capturing these experiences. An eye on the time here. This is also Sydney Katz because I have permission to use these photos, but there are many, many patients now who start coming to these clinics, not so no longer focusing on staff, no longer looking exclusively at model psychoses to understand or create a sort of empathetic response to patients with psychotic disorders, but to begin thinking about psychedelics as a therapeutic intervention to help people see themselves in a different light, to help people in some cases accept that there is a power bigger than themselves, see God in some words. And going through hundreds of trip reports from these clinical trials, we start to see that language shifting. This is an example here of a nurse describing how this, it was a man, um, I could go on all about the machismo aspect of the alcoholism trials, but it was mostly men who came through these particular trials. Anyway, I'll leave that as a footnote. He had a momentary oneness with God, had a vision while lying down of eyes closed in a spiral staircase and it goes on. This idea that there was a moment within the experience where people kind of reconciled um, with themselves or saw something that helped to give them an epiphany or a peak moment or a transitional moment became a pattern that by comparing these files, and these files are quite substantial because they to create transcripts for these eight hour experiences. It created a new vocabulary for thinking about how to understand where to assign the therapeutic benefit. Is it the drug itself? Is it, you know, wh where do we assign this? Is it hour three? Is it hour four? And there's a lot of debate and sort of methodological debate about where, where do we, which bits do we grab? And this I think leads very um, gently into researchers beginning to invest in notions of set and setting. So the, the phrasing itself is allegedly coined by Timothy Leary, although I'm not totally convinced, um, but researchers for a long time, um, including Betty Eisner, of course, and including a number of, of French psychiatrists, French women psychiatrists in, in Paris, were exploring ideas about how to attune the environment to also amplify or to um, facilitate the best reactions. And this again challenges some of the idea about whether it's the drug action exclusively or whether it's some kind of collective or combined effect. So this is an image allegedly of uh, Abram Hoffer and Duncan Blewett. Abram Hoffer was located in Saskatoon, Duncan Blewett was in Regina. And here they were playing around with different ideas. And they took this both from listening to patients and having conversations with them afterwards, but also from their own experiences about how to create a safe environment. A feeling, a feeling of security in the environment. And not, um, I should say, many of these were conducted in hospital spaces, but they kept them in private rooms. They didn't want them adjacent to hallways where there was lots of activity, where there were lots of people moving around. They brought record players into this. They wanted to have plants or something, uh, uh, growing growing plants in, in, the in the space. They also used niacin to reverse reactions a variety of different things. Anyway, this notion that you had to pair the environment with the substance itself became really important to their research. And we see, and these are just a couple of examples, but 
we begin to see also how, again, I mentioned the sort of interdisciplinary nature of this, music therapists are increasingly relied upon to start thinking about how to also adjust a soundscape to amplify and to really um, optimize those experiences. So what kind of music, what kind of tempo, should it be familiar, should it be exotic, as the word was used to describe, and how much did music and sound play into experiences, and what was the relationship between, again, the dose, but also the environment and the soundscapes that, so all of these things sort of enrich the research landscape as they draw in different influences to try to think about set and setting in really interesting ways. The results with alcoholics going through these experiences, most of which were single experiences, um, and most of them were sort of one-on-one. -on -one. So you'd have one patient and usually um, about four uh, different people involved. So a psychiatrist, often a psychologist. Um, I wish I had a, a clearer statement on this, but there's often a woman there. She's not always a trained nurse. She's sometimes the wife of one of the psychiatrists who may in fact have been recognized as providing, I'll say small end nursing, but as far as I can tell was not paid for and perhaps did not have the, the um, qualifications to work as a nurse. Nonetheless, my point is that there are a variety of people in this room and patients were never left alone. Under these circumstances and with two year follow-ups, there were 30 to 90% success rates and success by this measure was returning to work or getting gainful employment uh, restoring relationships as vouched for by, by employers, wives, children, um, church leaders, if that was appropriate. And these are remarkable. These are remarkable findings that are much more dramatic than anything that existed in the contemporary literature at this time. There's a, um, a link here to a, a master's thesis written about, you know, some of the spiritual angles that were picked up on them in this regard. And for time reasons, I'm not going to go into that in, in great detail, but I will just mention that these findings also kind of galvanized support for psychedelic research in a region that was committed to healthcare reforms, that was interested in being a leader in challenging conventional ways of dealing with things like mental health and addiction. People like Tommy Douglas were vocally supportive of the psychedelic research. I have yet to ever find evidence that he took psychedelics, but I continue to look. Alcoholics Anonymous in some regions, including Manitoba, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, advertised support for psychedelic research to help people overcome the hurdle of accepting that they needed help. And then Alcoholics Anonymous partnered with some of these psychedelic research units to then provide ongoing support, to maintain follow-ups, to help people find employment, to help form men's groups in many cases, to help people then transition out of a life of, um, of problem drinking, as they called it. Some religious groups, including uh, a number that are cited in Michael Lyon's thesis, um, began to be very curious about this. There were declining rates of um, churchgoers in this period, and the idea that people might see God, they might reconnect with a kind of um, spiritual sense of themselves, was really exciting to churches with sort of withering um, uh, people coming to them. Uh, sorry, I'm moving across denominations. And a number of different religious leaders got together to explore these aspects by taking, um, in some cases, LSD themselves, um, but also by committing themselves to thinking about the role of churches in you know, challenging some of the temperance language about abstinence and instead embracing a different model that allowed for using pharmaceuticals, using psychedelics as a way of bringing people into um, a, a sort of a, a moral space. This research, of course, was also influenced by and ultimately um, took forward some of the political language around looking at Indigenous uses. I don't want to overplay this. I don't want to, um, I, I know I'm quite sympathetic to the, the psychedelic researchers. They learned a lot from um, reading widely and participating in and observing peyote ceremonies and, as one example, but also thinking more broadly. Now, at the end of the day, they're still 1950s British um, trained uh, Canadian-based researchers, but nonetheless, um, they were wise to this. This wasn't something that was sort of off of their agenda. And in 1956, the Native American Church of Canada invited Humphrey Osmond, Abram Hoffer, Duncan Blewett, and a, a psychologist named Teddy Wekowitz to participate in a peyote ceremony in North Battleford. 
This was in part because the federal government was um, planning to ban peyote ceremonies. They were, this was part and parcel of stamping out a variety of different indigenous cultural rights. And they were on the eve of changing the Indian Act, which would have made, there was a brief window where peyote ceremonies were permitted in Canada at this time. And, and again, but for the moment, uh, leading up to 1956, there was a brief moment where there were two um, groups that were allowed to practice peyote ceremonies under the guise of the Native American Church of Canada. And they invited these, what they described as white scientists, to participate in this event to try to bring some sort of um, gravitas, to try to bring some proof and to help them support their efforts to maintain access to these cultural rights. You can read about this in A Culture's Catalyst, which includes some of the voices of the Indigenous participants, many of whom went unnamed in the recording at the time. One of the things that happened here was that Humphrey Osmond participated fully. So he took four peyote buttons, he threw up a lot, he felt very embarrassed, um, but he also felt very humbled. He wrote about this very sympathetically, very honestly, and it I think it helped him to he became an advocate for Indigenous cultural rights, which also challenged the way that he used the medical language to talk about peyote and ultimately masculine. One of the things that he recognized was the power of ritual, the power of the drumming and the breathing and the preparation, the integration, the intention that was part and parcel of a peyote ceremony, which was not part of a clinical trial necessarily. And he tried to bring some of that back into a sort of laboratory environment or a clinical environment. Ultimately, I will just quickly mention that um, the federal government in Canada allowed for the Native American church to continue to exist, but they were not allowed to import peyote. So this was the way that the Canadian government kind of did an end run around the issue. But within a few years, the story begins to change and, and does so quickly and dramatically. In 1962, the thalidomide was pulled from the shelves of the Canadian um, marketplace. Um, this after West Germany had pulled their supplies. Of course, there's a West and East Germany at this point. Um, and thalidomide, you know, created this real sort of lightning rod moment where um, consumers, Canadians, Americans, America never uh, allowed for thalidomide, they never regulated it. Um, but it was this moment where people were really shocked. You know, how could scientists have promoted this particular drug, this pharmaceutical product, when it caused such, um, such, visu such visible horrific um, teratogenic birth defects in these children. And the thalidomide scare, I think, really kind of shook, um, shook consumers and shook faith in the scientific community to determine the appropriate level of testing, experimentation, and the efficacy of those clinical trials. At the time, the Canadian parliamentarians created a new schedule, H, um, which was reserved for drugs that required further medical attention before they could be considered safe. They added LSD to this list and they did it in a somewhat casual form. Um, there wasn't a lot of evidence and the psychedelic research community was not really coherent at this point. Anyway, I'll get to that in a moment as well. What it did, I think, was partly bring that, that psychedelic community together. So the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, the Canadian Psychiatric Association, the Canadian, Psycho uh, sorry, Canadian Psychological Association banded together and res resisted this move to put LSD on a banned substances, what would become on this, on this list that would take it out of researchers' um, prerogatives. And it would mean that every application had to go through the Minister of Health. You can see down at the bottom, Pierre Burton, for those of you old enough to know who Pierre Burton is, um, who convened a debate with um, Abe Hoffer, who's seated, ne seated next to him, and University of Toronto students who were debating, you know, the merits and the, the problems with, uh, potential problems with LSD. And this began to sort of spill into the, into the public. So no longer are these debates within medical researchers wondering how to measure these effects, whether you should listen to Beethoven or Bach, uh, whether you should have a rose in the room. Those conversations were now sort of beyond the reach of the scientific community. The cat was out of the bag, the genie was out of the bottle, if you will. Things sort of spill into the public space in ways that kind of create their own narratives. Oops. 1962, same year. So thalidomide, 1962, public debates begin in 1962. Timothy Leary, also in 1962, moves from 
a foot, what who may have been a footnote in this history, but he loses his job at Harvard University and kind of propels into the public spotlight. Um, some of the research that I did tracking his sort of fame in this moment, he moved from not really being mentioned in mainstream media to having five or 600 articles in things like the Washington Post or the New York Times, even the Globe and Mail, Toronto Star, or starting to like, Timothy Leary was becoming a kind of symbol for what psychedelics, and then especially LSD in this case, what they came to represent. And his message was, don't listen to the scientists. In fact, he rejected that, though he was trained as a psychologist, he no longer sort of operated within their professional milieu. Instead, he argued that, you know, an entire generation needs to tune in, turn on and drop out. This was something that was going to really piss off Richard Nixon, by the way. 1962, same year. Sandoz Pharmaceutical Laboratory starts getting quite nervous as they are the sole proprietor of LSD still at this time, or delisergic acid dathomide, delicid, it comes under different names. So they send researchers like Albert Hoffman and Abe Hoffer actually went along with them to San Francisco. They go to Haight-Ashbury. And what they find is that there are a variety of substances that are being sold as acid or LSD. People assume that they all are sort of a standard product. And what they find are 70, 80, 90 different substances that are being sold on blotter paper that are not Sandoz approved LSD. They may cause people to hallucinate, they may have water on the paper. Um, there are a variety of different things that are being sold. And Sandoz is very concerned about its reputation as a pharmaceutical company that is now looking at being blamed for the rise of the black market, but also some very sort of um, reckless use, certainly spilling beyond the medical confines. We know that this story unfolds in the United States in rather dramatic ways. I think part of that is related to the narratives around Timothy Leary, but also the rise of Richard Nixon and the war on drugs. But Canada too plays a part in this. And there are re the researchers are caught up in this moment and these uh, depictions are trying to, to remind us that researchers are still trying to do their, their work. They're still trying to do comparative trials. What happens if we draw in these volunteers? What happens when we give this to naive drug users? And the problem is there aren't naive drug users anymore. They're not finding people who don't already come with a preconceptualization of what it's going to be like. In fact, students are lining up to be part of these trials, bringing their own records, trying it out for the third, fourth, 18th time. And this is no longer fitting the kind of research protocols that were designed at the time. And it's confounding their abilities to do the kind of research that they want to prove that these have therapeutic benefits, which they had to do because they were on schedule H. We also know that the black market was seeping into Canadian campuses. And, you know, again, these depictions start showing um, the, the media coverage at this time changes dramatically. It's, it's almost overnight. It moves from scientists are doing something interesting with these drugs that are, you know, causing us to think differently about brains. And I, I don't even exaggerate so much. It's very kind of neutral science forward language. And it moves to front pages of like, these are literal headlines. Matt and goes berserk, you know, um, two-year-old takes, uh, takes acid found in dad's fridge, you know, th there's all sorts of these uh, really outrageous stories that also borrow language from the thalidomide scare. There are claims later retracted that um, LSD causes teratogenic birth defects. And there's a real sort of collapsing of ideas that associate particular drugs with all of these sort of horrific, scary, um, uncontrolled, reckless, dangerous things. In Canada, what happens is um, parliamentarians here, this is John D. Diefenbaker, he's the leader of the opposition at this time, he's outraged at, you know, how could this have happened? How could we have allowed this kind of research to spill into the spiral out of control? And meanwhile, there are a variety of magazines, McLean's again, um, but also television programs which are talking about psychedelics in open and sometimes neutral and sometimes very sympathetic ways. And parliamentarians are getting very frustrated with this and they, you can start to see the conversations sort of bifurcating or dividing into a for and against mentality. This coincides with international pressure, of course, a lot from the United States going on an anti-drug campaign and this will move into Nancy Reagan's sort of war or her anti, just say, um, really me campaign and her anti-drug campaigns, but it coincides with this sort of international language that's drawing firm lines between good drugs and bad and dramatically changing the capacity for researchers to continue doing legitimate um, scientific research with 
these drugs. In, in some respects, I think that the, the death knell, if you will, in terms of the regulation came in 1968. There was already pressure from a variety of other international organizations. California had outlawed research on psychedelics by 1966. New York followed suit within a month. Um, there are a variety of places, including the World, World Health Organization, that are making very strong declarative statements about the dangerousness, and that's the word that's used, the dangers of continued research with psychedelics. In Canada, Senator Molson, the godfather of the Molson Brewing Company, um, helps to champion a motion to move LSD out of the Schedule H into a dangerous substances position, which moves it out of the capacity to continue to do genuine uh, medical research in this area. So in some respects, that's, that's sort of where the story ends. Uh, at least that was where the story ended when I finished my PhD in 2005. I was like, all right, now move on, do something else. And that's the end. But of course, you wouldn't all be here, I don't think, if that was the end of the story. And we know that there is another chapter, and I would argue several chapters yet to be written or being written now. And uh, one example is, you know, David Nutt declaring in 2007 in the Lancet magazine, or sorry, Lancet Journal, that, you know, we've had this all wrong. Our notions of what is dangerous and what is not dangerous, what is healthful or not, has been wrongheaded. And the way that we harness scientific evidence to make those so-called evidence-based decisions about drugs and their classifications is also wrong. It is corrupted. It has become, his words, labyrinthian, um, but also it is driven by an economic enterprise that does not actually um, prioritize the therapeutic benefits or dangers. Of course, he lost his job as the advisor to the British Food and Drug Administration, um, but is you know, doing quite well, I think, at Imperial College leading a psychedelic research unit there, where he's reorganized and suggested reorganizing how we think about the dangers of drugs thinking about addictive qualities, thinking about the cost to healthcare systems over a lifetime, thinking about the cost in terms of um, alcohol related um, problems, so not just drinking in an episodic way. And we've seen a number of researchers come forward and pronounce, including like Ben Sessa here, that we are in actually experiencing a psychedelic renaissance, and that in fact we need to experience a psychedelic renaissance, that we have too quickly as a society, we have moved past some of the earlier ideas from the 1950s and earlier, and we've moved in, into a space where we need to rethink some of the things that we threw out with the earlier psychedelic renaissance or the earlier psychedelic period. The other picture here on the left is from Stephen Ross, who is of course working at New York. Um, some of you may, may know about his work with palliative care. We've started to see, I think, a real turning point, not only within the regulation conversations and within the psychedelic science, much of that literature, which was kind of bubbling there, but has now really reached a fever pitch in terms of the research, but we're starting to see the kind of mainstreaming of psychedelic ideas as well. Of course, Michael Pollan has been a major player in that, um, and there are others. You can't turn on Netflix these days, I don't think, without finding like some kind of like normalizing gestures to psychedelics and um, to their past. We've started to see reinvestments in psychedelic research as well. And these are just a couple of examples, John Hopkins, Berkeley, and Canada, I think, has a very important role to play in reconnecting this past with the future. Not only in terms of, of palliative care and end-of-life anxiety, which is where I think a lot of the conversation is taking place right now, but in rethinking the way that we harness evidence to make healthcare decisions and healthcare regulatory decisions, health policy decisions. In thinking about issues of access, in thinking about the way that Canada has privileged and prioritized healthcare as a human right and a value, and where psychedelics fit into that and where clinical trials fit into those conversations, if at all. I'm very pleased and just excited and thrilled. It's like historically beautiful to me that the first legal psilocybin treatment in Canada in the 21st century returned to Saskatchewan, the home of the word psychedelic, or at least the home of the coining of the word. And uh, when then 52 year old Thomas Hartle uh, legally gained access to psilocybin for his end of life anxiety. And if, if you haven't heard from Thomas, please, you know, seek him out. He is an absolute inspiration and just a brilliant, wonderful person. I'm so pleased to be sort of on this journey with him advocating 
advocating for the return of a psychedelic moment. I, I don't want to steal Thomas's words. I want to leave time for questions. And so I just want to end by thanking all of you for your attention. Um, there's a couple of uh, references here to some of the images that I used. And uh, I'm very happy to take questions. And I look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Amazing. Thank you so much. You're always so full of so much more information. I wanted to, um, there's some great questions that have been submitted, but I wanted, I want to loop back on some of the things you mentioned. So you talk about this, this transition from science and medicine and research into debating in parliament and then these becoming, being set, um, moved into the uh, section H. How did, did you find anything in your research around that in the parliamentary debates? Like, how do you go from science and MDs driving it? And I know this, and I'm sure you know this from a lot of the MDs that were using MDMA in the 80s mm. to, to that kind of boring logical science medicine conversation being kind of pushed aside to sensationalism. You know, it's a really good question, and I, I wish I had a direct, clear answer. Um, I, I think in mean, my sort of historical, if I if I put on like you know my um, elbow pads here and think about like my tweed jacket, think about like the historian's answer. I think there was a different culture of medicine and medical research, and I think there was um, a more of a sense of trusting your doctor, um, and so the doctors had a, a different a kind of authority, which is not to say that they don't now. But I think a combination of subspecializations within medicine, but also a kind of growing disillusionment with um, pharmaceutical based treatments for mental health on a sort of social level, on a cultural level, has also sort of poked holes in some of the sense that, like, actually, maybe we need a variety of voices making decisions about what is safe or effective or cost effective. And I think, sort of, thinking about those questions in a more holistic way, um, even thinking about health policy in a more holistic way, you know, like thinking about access and, you know, gender and ritual and race and all of these sorts of things in a more intersectional way, I think has caused us to sort of move away from looking at the physician as being the arbiter of what is safe or good and thinking more in a, a collective sense uh, about like, how do we know what we trust? How do we come to trust these experiences, these medicines? It, it will be interesting to see, and there certainly were conversations in the back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s about whether whether you need physicians to administer these experiences, or whether in fact it could be better or different, or you know what other alternative models were there from a, a sort of physician-based uh, delivery system. And I I don't. I don't hear the conversation. I mean, I'm sure the conversation goes there among many people, you know, in ways that are maybe not participating in the public discourse. Um, but it's an interesting open question also about, you know, when do we trust physicians to make these decisions? And I know as a physician, I wonder, I'm curious about your thoughts on this as well, because I wonder if you, if you sense that tension or if you've experienced that, um, you know, how, how people come to make decisions about when to trust any kind of medical intervention. Yeah, well, I, I certainly I think we're seeing it more politicized, and uh, I think a, a lot of our goals as MDs is to return it to boring. So that's just, just a boring conversation about what is the best scenario so that a patient can can take charge and, and be more autonomous. There's another story you didn't tell today. I want you to tell it because I think it's really interesting. It's about um, in Weyburn, mm -hmm. um, the fact that a, an architect taking LSD. Yeah. Can you tell that because there, there's a follow up on that? Sure. Um, yeah, I'll try to I'll try to be brief. Um, Kiyoshi Izumi was a, an architect who came to Weyburn initially to escape internment as a Japanese Canadian during the Second World War. He left British Columbia where he was in high school and he and his he came to Saskatchewan and was taken in by a Japanese family. Um, Saskatchewan didn't have internment not because they were so enlightened necessarily, but it just wasn't cost effective. There weren't enough Japanese Canadian families um, to justify. So they kept them under police surveillance. Anyway, all that to say, here he was, he ended up in Saskatchewan sort of circumstantially. And he ultimately was hired by Humphrey Osmond to conduct a study of the Weyburn Asylum, which part of Humphrey Osmond's work was to reform the asylum. 
And what he wanted to do was understand what it was like to be a schizophrenic patient living in this institutional space. And what better way to do that than embrace the model psychosis and have Kiyoshi Izumi take LSD and then wander around the halls of this asylum. And he made some really, I think, quite amazing. And sometimes we might think of them as not so amazing, like, well, that should have been obvious. Like, if you have a checkered pattern on the floor, people might think that those dark tiles are holes, their perception may be off and they don't wanna step on them. And so people weren't staying in their rooms because they were antisocial or didn't want to engage in the group activity. They were worried because they thought they were gonna fall into holes as they left their room. So things like that, which were like, we might think of as obvious, but were also really powerfully insightful. And they'd started making other design recommendations like the height of the bed, so that when people were getting out of bed, they could actually put their feet on the floor and not have to dangle over the floor and like jump onto the floor. Nurses were concerned about this though because they had to bend over to reach their patients. And so there were like occupational health concerns with um, the staff. And so it, it raised all of these other issues about how we accommodate differences in perception. Um, along a whole variety of, of uh, spectrums. And, and yeah, it's a fascinating story. If anybody wants, I can I can send you some links. <laughs> well, and I think what that links into is even mod, like science, our um, medicine now is that so often how we approach our patients and the bureaucracy around giving patient care doesn't come from the patient perspective. It comes to the top down checkbox, policymakers, paper makers, and not from the patient. Even, even not even from the MD or nurse perspective of what they need. So that story to me just really, really drove home how we really need to be, it, we need to flip this all upside down and be, and be going from the patient perspective all the time here. And that, you know, of course, but you know, having somebody who builds buildings to see it from the patient perspective is so important. Um, there's another, there's some other questions that kind of bridge us into the future, but I want to hit uh, one more that um, before we go there is, you talked about um, the peyote um, ceremonies in North Battleford, mm -hmm. and then that it was permitted in Canada. So first of all, that knowledge was translated from mm -hmm. the peyote peoples like in Southern US, Northern uh, Mexico. Yeah. So there was obviously some knowledge translation be between the peoples, mm -hmm. but permitted, what did you like, how did, was, did the government of Canada just also stick their nose in there and say, you can't do that. Like, I wanna understand that a bit more. Yeah, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll try to dance my way through this a little bit, but I, I can show you some references and take a look at the Culture's Catalyst book, which I, I helped to edit, but it was a book that was written um, and publishers didn't pick it up in the 1960s. And I think it was due to, in part, the political nature of these questions. Um, and so we hauled it out of the archives and sort of um, tried to give it a little bit of academic scaffolding, like some reference points to update it without changing the language, without changing the original parts, and it's available. Um, you can now look at it. One of the things that happened was, yes, absolutely translational knowledge. So there was definitely um, people, ethnobotanists, anthropologists were traveling through Saskatchewan and bringing some of the information and some of their experiences into Saskatchewan, or at least corresponding with them. Um, you know, Slotkin was there, uh, Richard Schultes was there, you know, so bringing in some of these ideas that were bringing um, in a disciplinary space, but certainly bringing in different cultural um, experiences. At that peyote ceremony that took place in North Battleford, there were representatives from the Native American church from Montana and from North Dakota who also attended. And so there's a kind of direct personal connection there as well. And part of it was, you know, pushing back against regulations that were trying to change what was considered appropriate under the Indian Act. And it's an interesting, so there's like these different regulatory spaces or these pillars where you have changes to like, well, you know, are we gonna stomp out the, you know, sort of powwows? And, um, and sweats, and the, the, those were sort of up for conversation at this time as well. And the peyote ceremony is part of a conversation about cultural rights and Indian Act changes. And so it gets sort of twisted in this particular space. So peyote is not initially brought up as a concern. It's the cultural rights. It's, it's this imported American um, pan, in, um, pan, they describe it as pan tribal um, religion that part sort of raises the ire of Indian agents and makes them concerned about cultural importation. And it's not authentic, you know, Cree-based Indigenous practice. It's not peyote initially, but RCMP officers 
and local politicians, the local MP for um, North, um, North Battleford, for example, somehow get onto this idea that peyote is also being used to intoxicate people, to make them, when they use the words intoxication, drunk, they describe these orgy parties that are taking place. This spills into the um, media, the local media at the time. And it starts to change that conversation from cultural rights to oh, people are taking drugs. And even though in the personal testimonies and recommendations from Indigenous participants, this was not about peyote, this was about a healing ceremony. This was a healing ceremony that was recognizing the scars of colonialism. And they use that language to describe, like, we're trying to come together and like heal our communities. But it gets sort of written up as a peyote ceremony where people are taking drugs that are imported from Mexico. I mean, so it'd be, it, they move it into different sort of jurisdictional ter territory or different sort of bureaucratic territory, at least. And I think that's where it kind of lands in the end is by seizing upon the peyote component. And as a result, it also kind of undermines the expressions of cultural rights. Yes, infuriating. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it totally um, is. And there are still there are still um, people who are looking into this case, uh, th these sort of experiences right now and a lot. I think there's a lot that's continued. Some of this knowledge has gone underground as well. People are uncomfortable talking about this right now and really resurrecting some of these ideas. And yet I, I hope that, you know, there will be an opportunity to create safe space to kind of reconcile some of these past injustices, but also thinking about what peyote meant to Saskatchewan, Alberta, prairie indigenous communities um, who did sort of see this as a, a political tool, as a healing tool, as a spiritual tool. I think that knowledge is also at risk of being lost if we don't sort of capture some of that generational knowledge soon. Yeah, especially if people are passing and that knowledge is passing. Yeah. Thanks for extrapolating on that. Another thing here, um, I noticed that in, you know, the, I think it was a Hollywood uh, hospital photo, mm -hmm. you know, the therapy center or the therapy room set up, it looks very much like the John Hopkins one. Yes. <laughs> like we haven't come very far. And, and the other thing, yeah, yeah, it looks very similar. And the other thing um, is what I find really interesting. So now, like modern day, when we're doing psychedelic therapy now, um, we, we're always talking about set and setting and mm -hmm. setting that up. And and quite often, even more of the research is is talking around positive priming, positive priming around the music, it's the music that a person likes, a positive priming around the visuals someone might have and the work that they might be doing. Did you come across anything of that when you're looking back in the historical records? Because a, for a lot, now it's so much in the media and, and there's kind of all this like priming by default. If you just yeah. even open up anything, you might, you're gonna read about some star psychedelic experience. But back then there would have been a lot more psychedelic naive people going through. So knowing what you're kind of hearing now and knowing what was hearing then, did you see any difference in that? Like, you know, kind of more of the, like, yeah, I don't, am I clear in that question? I think so. And I'll, I've got a kind of like cheeky answer, which is uh, I have a grant proposal <laughs> to compare the sort of evolution of protocols for set and setting, but also things around doses and, you know, the musical selections, what kind of people do, should you have in the environment? I mean, it's not just a matter of like, I want to, you know, a scientist and an Anglican and a, you know, it was, it came down to that in some cases, Yeah. but you know, what kinds of empathetic presences do people choose to have and what ones do they not want? I don't want my mother there, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but really sort of dealing with this at a granular level. And I want to compare that and our proposal is to compare that with some of the evolving protocols today in some of the research that's taking place contemporarily. And I think you're right. There are stunning parallels, stunning similarities, like, you know, talking to Bill Richards about like, so like, why was the rose there? Like, where did you get that? You know, and, and, and thinking about the Johns Hopkins unit, I toured the unit and I was like blown away by the artwork that was chosen strategically. And I pulled out, well, not in my pocket, but on my hard drive, <laughs> this 1952 guidebook for how to design a room. It doesn't say set and setting, it doesn't say those words but how, and there's like the artwork should be like this, but not like that. It should have harsh lines, but you know, ones that invite the uh, gaze of the, but not, you know, making them feel uncomfortable. They talk about music in really fascinating ways. Um, 
they don't really want too much patient selection of the music, in fact, initially. But there's a lot of conversation and like theorizing about those sort of soundscapes. You know, do you want to just hear the natural sounds of birds? And in the clinical trials, no, but that contradicts some of the, what we might think of as non-clinical trials where we start to think about, well, at the peyote ceremony, there's a lot of drumming and there's singing and it also is not verbal. And so that changed also the way that people were thinking about, well, wait, wait a second, do we want lyrics? Is that useful? Or do we want, um, you know, there was consensus at one point that we didn't want this Beethoven song. And I don't know enough about how that song would make people react to, <laughs> to say anything intelligent about it. But I was fascinated by like how much attention was spent focusing on these things. I wanted to say quickly though, a lot of that information and was sort of cast aside when it came to publishing reports. And I, I think that some of it is because the published reports had to go through, you know, a peer review analysis and they had to meet certain standards. And when they were sort of squeezing information through um, the dissemination machine, if you will, uh, the translation machine, a lot of those details were lost. And so you kind of compress that information in a way that feeds a clinical trial protocol. And one of the things that Osman complained about, he said, we have all of this information and we're only looking at a fraction of it. We don't even know what we don't know. And I think this was one of the things that has, to me, really convinced me about some of the, the challenges of seeing a clinical trial as an arbiter of liability, as an arbiter of efficacy that allows us to say this is safe, but it doesn't necessarily allow us to understand the meanings associated with those experiences. And if we don't have the capacity to sort of provide some meaning making scaffolding, I don't even know what words to use there, but what do we do? Do with the like eight hour transcript, how do we know which parts are important? And because even interviewing people who had been treated 40 years before I interviewed them, they're like, well, at the time I thought this was important, but I've reflected on that experience a lot. And now I understand this is important. So I think all of that kind of information to me shatters some of the ideas that the clinical trial actually helps to give us some solid proof or evidence of what we think is powerful or meaningful. You know, and as for me as an MD and a researcher as well, it to me it it is it I'm just have this bubbling under the surface anger that you know we're 40 years behind. Like we would have had a lot of these questions answered if not for the political climate and the war on drugs, I, right? I think so. I mean, and I'm I want to be. I want to be cautious, inclusive, and super cynical about everything. <laughs> like, I, I think you're right. I think there was, I think the political climate had a lot to do with it. I do think there was some reckless behavior as well. Like, I think, you know, I don't think every trip was, you know, going to change the world in insightful, po positive ways. I do think that there were dangerous circumstances. We know there were cases of sexual abuse, for example. We know that there was cultural appropriation. You know, there are things that other kinds of lessons that we should take from this moment as well. I guess for me, as I trained as a historian of science and medicine, I'm, I'm sort of still stuck in that in that zone. I think that there are also real moments of reconciliation that we have yet to sort of face and confront about how do we think about healing and illness and perception and disorder and trauma. Um, and I think, I think we kind of, you know, I don't know if I'm allowed to say like we should throw out the DSM and start over again. I'm not sure that, I, I don't know if I should say that, but, but a lot I, of psychiatrists we need to think outside the box. <laughs> a lot of psychiatrists yeah. agree with you. Yeah. They call it a work of fiction. I I don't know, like I, I work with uh, psychiatric survivors and I'm not sure that, that, you know, taking away all supports and starting from fresh is actually responsible, but I think empowering people with lived experience to participate in um, healthcare policy making and you know healthcare design is critical. And it's something that kind of flips the switch on that power dynamic as well and draws on a different variety of evidence to inform the way that we try to create um, you know, a more caring healthcare system. <laughs> I thought, I love that. So uh, clearly the, the movement from the past into the future is you know, a lot of people are cautioning that, you know, we don't want to repeat the, the, the mistakes of the past. Um, what does this look like going forward? Do you think we can repeat the mistakes of the past? Or do you think we're in a completely different time now? Do you think that we have a more adult view of this? 
Yeah, I mean, I will lose my job if I say that, you know, history is not important. So I'm going to just say, of course. <laughs> Um, but but like even even jokingly aside, I do you know I think there are some lessons that are that are easy to grasp from from looking at this kind of historical landscape and saying like ah oh, you know this this was wrongheaded the way that this was regulated or the way it was scheduled. But I think there are some deeper lessons that are harder to sort of pinpoint and grab and say okay that's something that we want to avoid or grab onto. And some of that I think is thinking about you know the encroachment of Western ideas and sort of Western science in a cultural space that, that has pushed out indigenous ways of knowing plants and indigenous ways of knowing and thinking about healing and intersections of healing and spirituality. I think those are harder questions to say, yeah, we should do that. We should grab that piece um, because that actually involves a much bigger set of conversations about you know, how, I mean, Canada's engaged in truth and reconciliation and I don't think this is top of the agenda, but, but I think really kind of grasping what what does it mean to have kind of um, how to create knowledge in this space and how do we share that knowledge and how do we create reciprocal relationships that allow for a fair patient centered patient driven experience to move forward and and maybe I shouldn't be using the word patient. Um, you know that already sort of prioritizes a particular view, but I think some of those deeper harder to answer questions or harder to even articulate questions are still unanswered and unresolved. I don't think we have yet identified a clear path. I, I think that we can convince regulators that um, certain things can be regulated. And I think that we can work out the legalese. Whether we can continue to manage this safely going forward, um, I don't know. I don't think we have any evidence or experience to, to say that you know we figured that all out. That, there won't be any cultural appropriation, there won't be any sexual abuse, there won't be any power dynamics that take place. I mean, all of those things are, you know, perpetual questions of humanity and not um, specific to a time period. I don't think we're more enlightened today in terms of how to be kind to each other. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, I agree. I think, I, but, I, you know, I have a great, great optimism. I think we have, I think it's a more of an adult conversation now. I think we're um, I think we're lucky in Canada that we're a little bit beyond the hysteria mm. of it and that we do want to legitimately lean into the science and the research. And I really do hope our regulators and, and our parliamentarians will, will make sure that the funding is available so that, you know, you can do your dream studies too. We can all do our dream studies and really fill in the evidence so that we actually are doing what's best for the Canadians across the board. So. Absolutely. I, I think if I may just say, I think that in the 1950s, there was a real searching moment, you know, um, you know, people had come through the Second World War, you know, the horrors of the Holocaust and the sort of realization of science and policy run amok. And I think it's, you know, we, we have to recognize the kind of deep soul searching moment that um, you know, the world was launched into in those moments as well. We have a lot of focus on human experimentation and ethics coming into that space in really dramatic ways. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of searching. And I think, I think today, um, as we come through a global pandemic, we again are in this moment of searching of frustration, of like wanting to come out of hibernation, but also being wounded and traumatized from something that has impacted us. And now we could argue that World War II didn't impact the people of Canada as much as they did the people in France, for example. But I think that kind of global trauma, that global suffering created moments of real curiosity and optimism for searching for new ideas. And I think we are sort of similar in that respect. And I, I won't, you know, maybe we're more mature now, but I think I think that kind of collective desire to invest in something different is really powerful. And I think it's something that we can really lean into. Well, that's an inspiring note to end on. Thank you so much. I wanna be cognizant of your time. I just wanna say deep appreciation for you joining us today with um, the Canadian Psychedelic Association's uh, webinar here with Dr. Erica Dick. Um, we are going to put a lot of these resources on linked with this video. So it was, uh, it was Thomas Hartle. One of the questions was, it, um, we'll put some links to that. We'll put links to all of Erica's publications. Um, we'll put a link to the comic book that are the illustrative um, graphic novel that was you were showing. We'll make sure that that is all there. And every other thing that, uh, if we missed anything, just uh, reach out to us at info at psychedelic.com. Um, 
association.net and we'll make sure we link it too. And I just wanna say thank you again, Erica. This was fantastic. The foundation is so important to really understand how we got to where we are and how we can move forward as a more thoughtful peoples. So thank you again. Pam, thanks so much for having me and thank you to everyone for participating. It's been a real pleasure.